right. Celine, do you want to go ahead and kick off with your announcement? And we'll turn to Marcelo. All right. Yeah, thank you, um, Marcelo. I'm sorry, I'm going to steal like two minutes at the beginning, if that's OK. Yeah, no worries, um, no I way. am just putting a plug in for the bioacoustic stack exchange effort that's going on. Um, some of you may have heard of this or seen emails from me or on Twitter. Um, but basically, the idea is uh, if you, you know, if you like Google something in R or MATLAB, it usually takes you to Stack Overflow, and that's where you get answers, question about coding or whatever, GIS. Um, the idea is to make a similar site like that, but specifically for bioacoustics. And the idea is that it's freely available, it's archived, it's searchable, sort of like this question answer type site. And um, it's a huge benefit for science as a whole, especially for like beginning labs or people who are more disconnected from the bioacoustics community as it's getting more and more widely used. Um, hopefully that this would be a resource for the, the whole community. Um, so to make it happen, we have to put through a proposal to the Stack Exchange people. And then um, we'll go through, we have to basically prove to them that we are this like vibrant, active community who wants to help each other. And so we tried to do this a couple of years ago, but we, we realized we didn't have enough um, support before we got started. And so uh, this time we're trying to like recruit people early. So the idea is that we need active Stack Exchange users who either have um, 200 reputation points that basically proves that you've like answered or asked good questions on any of the Stack Exchange sites. Um, so people with who have those reputation points or who are willing to get those reputation points, um, we have a whole team of people who will help you do that. Uh, and so what we're asking is basically if you will sign up, if you're interested in either helping sort of as a passive helper who um, is willing to be a participant and join once the proposal launches, or if you're someone who wants to help recruit within your uh, own science community, you'll sign up um, using the Google form that I'll add in the chat here. And then that's where you'll input your email and your Stack Exchange username, uh, if you have one or, or go create one. And then we also have a Slack channel. Um, let me see if I can get that link too. Uh, not to add another Slack channel to people's worlds, but you can join this Slack channel and get help for the proposal. Um, we do like little weekly challenges to try and recruit people um, and you can meet all sorts of cool people on there. Uh, so please join, sign up, shoot me an email if you have any specific questions and don't wanna join another Slack channel. Um, and I'll put my email there uh, and I really hope you guys spread the word and join us. Thank you, Laurel and Marcelo. Absolutely. Are there any other announcements? All right, so our guest today will be Marcelo. He'll be talking about work that probably many of us know in various packages and are for working with bioacoustic data. Marcelo, you should have screen sharing privileges, so please feel free to go ahead and um, grab control of that whenever you want to. And thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. We're excited for your presentation. What happened to Marcelo? He was here just a minute ago. I wonder if he went to shift devices or something like that and dropped out. I bet it'll be back. Ah, here we go. Uh, sorry, I'm back. <laughs> oh, well, I'm good. I, I just gave you a glowing introduction and now um, I was just saying, I missed it. <laughs> oh, good. Um, we were just saying that you've worked on our packages that lots of us have used in various ways, and we're excited to have you here today. You should, I think you still retain screen sharing privileges. I'll double check and make sure that you're, yep, you're still co host. Okay. Um, Watch. All right, let's see. Can you guys see my? Yep, that looks great. Thank you. That's good. Can you give me one second? Sorry about that, guys. Uh, I'm at the university and they're doing stuff over here. So it might be a bit noisy, but I hope we can make it. So hello, everyone. Um, thanks for joining. I'm happy to, well, I'm 
Um, glad you guys invited me for this and, and happy to talk about the our packages. I have too many slides, that's a problem, but we'll see how that goes. Um, I got excited about putting more slides. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know what um, I missed um, the introduction, but uh, yeah, mostly work or I started developing these tools for trying to do my own analysis. And I've been working mostly with behavior and, and evolution of behavior. Um, so that's kind of the perspective of everything I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, what we want to, how we want to, you know, like analyze the data, annotate, uh, measure, and so to be able to answer the, the common questions that we have the most like, um, you know, like we can, I think, so I, I've seen like we have people from different areas here. So I think it's a good idea first to talk about um, why I have created those tools in the way that you will see. And it's because this um, is just to be able to, to answer these questions that we tend to ask in behavioral ecology, evolutionary biology, things related to, um, you know, the evolution of these signals, um, of how animals, for instance, can uh, vary those signals in space and time, or people talk about dialects or cultural evolution, things like that. And also trying to understand why they vary in, in those ways. Um, also, we, of course, want to understand the function, the function of the signals and the specific features of the signals, why some are, um, you know, like lower pitch, higher pitch, um, more elements. Um, and that's also a bit associated with this other question about the ecological and uh, social factors that uh, tend to favor specific features. Um, something that I, um, out of here is complexity is something that we are very interested in. Many fields are interested in understanding the evolution of biological complexity and, and in animal vocalizations, that's also the case. Um, and that's usually relating things about, you know, like if you have a complex social systems so or you have like different uh, environments for instance, like uh, more um, dense vegetations or things like that. So those are the factors that we try to um, understand how they affect the structure of the signals. And the important point here is that that last thing that I said, the structure of the signals, we want to make sure those things as um, accurate as possible uh, to be able to, to answer these things um, with precision. And that's the, the aim, I would say like, of, pretty much every single analysis we do acoustic analysis, um, uh, trying to get some numbers that represent the structure of those um, vocalizations, mostly, you know, like um, songs and calls and things like that. Uh, so we can do stats and try to relate it to, uh, relate the variation in that structure to these factors uh, that we um, propose are like generating that variation. So, so just keep that in mind um, to, to get, if you're coming from a different field, uh, maybe that helps you to understand what the hell is this guy doing <laughs> with, these, um, with these packages and this analysis. So, so that's the final goal of all these things. Um, and just to make it a bit clearer, um, I also included these um, workflow of the analysis that we tend to do. I think it's very similar to other things that people are doing by acoustics. We, of course, we need to get recordings. Uh, sometimes we can get synthetic recordings. That's helpful. Actually, we haven't done that uh, that much in, in behavior. I think that's a, a pretty um, promising tool that we should explore uh, more. But of course, we can go to the field, record, and we can get the recordings from libraries. I'm gonna show you some examples of how can you do that. And once you have that, you need to annotate signals. So basically find the target signals, songs of these individual females, males, um, specific species, uh, and be very um, precise about annotating, you know, like the frequency range and the 
start and end. I think in, for, in our case that we need to get those measurements and with those measurements of the structure, we will try to infer patterns, evolutionary patterns or biological patterns. We need, we have to be very um, specific or very precise, as you said, about those measurements. Um, I think that's a slightly different to other things about species classification, you know, when you just want to know is there a species of interest in this recording or not. Um, and once we do that, we extract features, measure things about the structure of the signals in um, different ways. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and we can, as these signals are usually multidimensional, you know, you can measure things about the amplitude, the energy, and variation in, in time and frequency and so on. Um, so we need to sometimes summarize that uh, multidimensionality or reduced dimensions and try to quantify variation in those reduced spaces. Um, and finally, once we do that, uh, we can do some stats to try to, to tackle those questions that I was talking about. So that's kind of the how I see the analysis we tend to do in, uh, in our field. And I will try to talk about the packages um, trying to, uh, to follow this um, workflow, more or less. But there is some overlap, some packages that work on different uh, stages. Um, so this is just an idea of the packages that I will be talking about. So Warble R is probably the, the most, well, the one that people heard about is um, mostly for measuring things, but it can help at other stages. I will also talk about array being, Arabian and own to get those annotations and also about phenotype space. It's a new package that is um, helps to with this uh, reduction of dimensionality. Not that much with that, but with measuring things on those new projected acoustic spaces. Um, that it turned out to be a bit tricky. And um, so we're trying to, to contribute with these, these are package to do measurements a bit more friendly for people. Um, and feel free to, to interrupt me and ask me anything at any point. Um, oh, there's one more package that I, I have a um, creating spectrograms, like dynamic spectrograms called DynaSpec, but I will show you. Um, so the things I'm going to be running here, I. I've been using the developmental versions of all those packages in case um, I can share this um, presentation with you guys if you want, or from the video, if you want to run things, uh, you will need in most cases those um, latest versions. Um, so for a first step, get recordings, you can go to the field with the microphone and recorder and get, um, get the recorders yourself. But um, there are many resources now um, available for getting um, recordings uh, online from, you know, like open access libraries and Warbear has a function to do that kind of stuff. Uh, you can search um, by species name or even by family and things like that. And I think it's, it's pretty, well, I have used that a lot. Um, it's like an amazing resource, of course, like, um, the Lab of All also has the call library and is easy to access. Uh, we don't have a function for doing that kind of stuff with uh, recordings from Eber or McCall library, but we hope in the future, near future, we might have something like that. But what I wanted to show you here is basically um, that is very easy to, um, to get data for um, a broad um, scale analysis of, you know, like many species and, um, and many geographic and time scales. For instance, this is the, the result of this code. I'm looking for this uh, striped throat at Hermit. Uh, and I got a bunch of recordings. I don't know how many, oh, 93 different recordings. Um, they have all this information about, you know, like um, English name, locality, lat long. Um, and you can actually, Warbird has some functions to look at the geographic spread of the, of those um, recordings. Um, so you can get a better idea where they come from. And you can even, I think, you can go directly to the, 
to the recording and listen to it and so on. Um, and once you do this kind of exploration, you can also filter things. Uh, let's say like I want things from, well, this is based, um, basic R like data frame subsetting code. So I'm here saying like, I want the songs or the ones that has the word song in the description of the vocalization type. And I want those from Costa Rica, just an example. Here I have 16 recordings and then you can go download those things. So you can easily get um, a lot of data. Uh, for instance, I could look at geographic variation. Maybe I will need a few more, but uh, um, you can easily get samples um, from, from recordings people have already shared. Uh, and that can be, you can get a lot of data. I'm, I'm still like trying to um, exploit this even more because it's an incredible resource for the instance. For instance, in this case, I'm looking for all recordings of Humbers, uh, Trochility is the family. So I can actually do that search and I got 8,300 um, um, entries and from 344 species, maybe some species, oh, well, you need to check the, the taxonomy they are using, but pretty much for every single species or 90% of the Humber species, you can get a recording. Uh, so you can just start imagining things that you can do at the evolution of the, of the songs in the whole clade, um, things about the variation in space um, for different species. I don't know. There is so many things you could do and you can very easily uh, do that um, with a few. You can get the data. I mean, it's not take some time to do this analysis, but something that was unthinkable, I don't know, 20 years ago, like go across the continent and have recordings for 90% uh, of the species. Now you can do it from your computer uh, with a few lines of code. So I find that pretty um, amazing actually. Um, so you can get recordings. You could also do create synthetic recordings in Warbird. Um, I won't be talking about that, but I think that's also something that we should be uh, doing uh, more often uh, because it gives you the power of knowing the actual you know, structure of the signals and then you can compare to analysis that are supposed to track those features and see which ones or tuning those analysis to actually get what you know um, should be found in the data. So that's, that's how ambition we should be doing more, uh, using more synthetic so. So that was well, just an example. You can get recordings with, uh, with Warbler, one of the packages. Something that I forget to mention is that um, I will be using this kind of syntax in R, you don't need to do that. So this is just telling R that I'm gonna use the function quark C from this package. And it's just to make sure we know where the functions come from, because you know, like I have, I'm gonna be talking about these different packages and sometimes I talk about one or the other or different uh, places. So it's better to, to keep that there so people know which package they should be looking for. Um, so once you have recordings, um, the next step, I think we all do that, is to annotate, right? To find the signals that we care about. Uh, we want to, um, in our case, to um, measure in some way. And again, I mean, we have two options. Um, we can do that manually. Uh, and if you do that, I tend to do this using Raven as the um, user interface. And I need to do the click, you know, like boxes around the, the um, sounds that I want to annotate. And then there is a package called rraven that helps you to import things from those uh, annotations to import the annotations into R. And it also helps you to go back and forth between R and Raven, running Raven. Um, and the other option is this new package called Ohum, which um, tries to do some automatic detection or it also helps to optimize diagnose and optimize detections based on reference tables, but I, I'm going to talk about that a bit more. So if you go with the manual um, annotation, 
then you need first to use Raven. Raven Light allows you to do these annotations and save the selections. Uh, you cannot measure acoustic parameters, but you can do that in R. So in case um, you don't have the license, um, you can still use Raven to do these kind of annotations. And these will produce a text file. If you do many recordings, you, you're gonna have many text files and you can import those um, annotations all at once into R using this package or Raven. Um, and is, uh, you just need to use this function in Raven. Uh, well, there's an argument called path that you can tell, I'm gonna look for file, text files uh, within this directory. Uh, and then it will put everything together in a single data frame when you have all those annotations. Um, this is just an example from annotations from different, four different uh, files. Um, and you can do, you can import that data into a format that is Warbler friendly. So it's ready to be used by Warbler. You'll see that Warbler is the one that allows you to do measurements. So it, um, you can do that with this other argument Warbler format equals true, and then you have the data ready for analysis. So that could be make things easier. Well, it also changing a few things. For instance, Warbler is using uh, hertz. No, it's using kilohertz uh, for frequency parameters or you know frequency ranges and stuff. And um, Raven is using uh, hertz. Uh, there are some slight differences that this thing, when you use Warbler format equals true, it will make sure that those things are in the right format to be used by Warbler. Um, so that's for a manual annotation. You can also, there was a package called, well, a software called Syrinx that I don't think is maintained anymore, but um, there is a package to, a function to import things from from series and I'm trying to, to include other uh, functions for uh, software, but um, you know, like Avisov has, the output is, an, um, it's a bit variable and he has, uh, I think it's an Excel file, so it's not that friendly, um, but I'm trying to expand to include other software for rotating sound um, that, um, so you can use Arabian as the default um, tool to get the data into a... So if you decide to do this uh, automatically, you can also use this package um, on home. Um, in fact, the, the functions that it provides for detection are functions that we have been using um, mostly in, in our field, like amplitude or energy-based detection and template-based detections. So those are useful for many of our goals, but are still, um, well, now they are simple compared to other things that people are doing with deep learning and um, machine learning and things like that. Um, but it also offered other um, capabilities like using reference annotations to diagnose uh, a, a detection routine. So you run a detection, it could be with this package, it could be from somewhere else. And then you have a bunch of um, recordings in which you already annotated every single signal that you want to detect. Of course, that's gonna be like a subset of the data that you want to analyze. And then you can tune the parameters of the detection so you can improve um, the detection by looking at those diagnostics. Um, and that can be helpful, as I said, not only for functions from this package, but for things that come from our packages or our software that you can import into R. And, um, and it, this is done by using signal detection theory um, applied to, to these, the performance of these detections in acoustics. And the idea here, well, it's, I mean, it's not rocket science. We know that we are trying to detect some signals. So it makes sense to use these, uh, Indices, so the two positives, for instance, so uh, signals that are correctly identified as signal, and you might have false positives when you something is detected, but it's not the signal you're looking for. You can have false negatives. Um, 
when signals are not correctly um, identified. And then and true negatives is anything else that should be um, should not be detected, which is a bit tricky in acoustics to define because the background noise is not necessarily discrete, um, you know, events. But um, you can still uh, measure at least the first three of those indices, and with those you can calculate uh, these two derived indices: sensitivity, which is a proportion of the target signals that you actually detected. And specificity, whether the things that you detected are actually the signals you were looking for. Um, so, though, well, the previous indices and these two, uh, mostly these two uh, derived indices, can help you to um, diagnose how good was a detection routine. Uh, and with that, if you run the detection with different uh, tuning parameters, you can compare how well the detection was with those parameters and find the, the best combination of tuning parameters for the specific you know, like signal and context that you, which you are doing the detection. And that's the, the, the main idea of, of the package. Not only providing those tools, uh, in some cases could be helpful, those tools for, I mean, for detecting signals energy-based detection and, and template-based detection, but also a way to uh, get a sense of whether I'm doing something right or, or not with the detection. I'm, I'm going the right direction. And optimize those um, tools that we are using for detecting. And I'm just gonna show you some examples. Um, so basically for doing this kind of um, diagnostic of, um, of the detections, you need a reference um, annotation or reference selection table, if you want to call it like that, um, which is basically something that tells the package, all right, we have these some files, and in this some files, we have um, signals, target signals in these specific locations. And actually, it, it only cares about the time. The frequency is not being included. Uh, so it only cares ab um, about the location of target signals in some, uh, some files um, that are found in those reference signals. Of course, you need to, to annotate every single signal in those recordings, otherwise it's gonna be hard to train something. It's gonna be confusing whether there are things that are being uh, detected but seem to be false positives. Uh, so you need to be exhaustive about uh, the annotation. But once you have that, you can use that to do this kind of uh, diagnostic and optimization. So this is um, just a graphic representation of those uh, reference signals, but basically is what I said, right? Like just uh, something that tells the, the package, there is a signal from this second to the sink, this, this are second, there's another signal, uh, this are position and so on. And it looks, um, this is some example data that comes with the package. And it looks like this. Um, of course, it's a very small um, data set. You cannot include like big files when you uh, you want to have these packages on, on CRAM, but um, it's enough to to show you you know to uh, to give you an idea of how that data should look like. So this is just for one of those recordings, and uh, that was the reference. And in this spectrogram, I'm showing you the reference and the detection. This is um. You know, it's just um, adaptation and, and made up to show you how the package works. So the yellow line shows you what are the signals we are uh, looking for, and then the red ones are the ones that were detected in this hypothetic uh, detection routine. Um, and you can see that detection is not great, right? Like it's, it's good, but it's not picking up everything. And so you can use this function, diagnose detection, to actually uh, compare those two things. So you can tell the function, all right, this is the reference um, annotation, and this is what I got with, uh, uh, with my detection. I'm showing you here just a subset of the output. The output also includes some things about the overlap of the signals in time. But um, for the sake of this example, I'm showing you here those uh, indices that I talked about at the beginning. Number of true positives, false positives, 
uh, false negatives. So those were the three that we missed in that hepatitis detection. And then it gives you um, um, these values for sensitivity and specificity. So basically, it was good uh, in the sense that everything that was detected, uh, they were target signals. Uh, so you don't have anything else detected as the signals you are looking for, but the sensitivity was, wasn't perfect because there were three signals. This is a very simple example in that we missed these three false negatives. So you have 0.7. Um, so just, this is just to show you how this um, diagnostic, diagnostic of detection works. Um, of course, you will run this with many more files. Um, and you can run it also with different uh, tuning parameters. And in that way, you will have different rows here for those different tuning parameters. Uh, and you can see which combination of those tuning parameters uh, will uh, does the, the best job at uh, detecting what you want. Um, and this is actually a, an example of, of that. This is with the same uh, example data. Here I'm running a template uh, correlation or template detection uh, that is actually split into uh, steps. First, you run the template correlator. So it's, you tell the, fun uh, the function, I have this. Uh, in this reference, I want to use the first uh, row as the template. And then I want to look for that across the signal using cross correlation. And once you have those uh, correlations, you use this second function template detector and you set a threshold um, for the correlation value for which uh, above that value it would be uh, detection. Um, below everything below the value would be ignored. So peaks above that value would be um, detected. And this is what we get with this uh, example data. So it's pretty good, but um, there is an extra peak here that was picked up. I don't know if you guys can see my cursor. I think you, you can. Um, so we can use the this function for optimizing the detection. In this case, we have a specific function for template detection in which you can try different thresholds. Uh, here, I want to try uh, five different thresholds from 0.1 to 0.5. And you also need to tell the, what are the, in this case, the template correlations and the reference that you will use to compare the detection uh, to this gold standard or, or perfect detection. And then you will get something like this in which you have um, the tuning parameters in this case is a single one because we're working with a correlation, a cross correlation. So basically, for each tre uh, threshold, you get uh, those um, signal detection indices. And we can focus on these the last uh, two sensitivity and specificity. But the, in this simple example, um, once you go above 0.4 for the threshold, you get a perfect detection in which sensitivity is one and also specificity is one. So you pick up everything you want and you don't pick up any other signal. Um, and that's the way that, um, that I, um, well, I propose uh, these functions should be used. In this case, it's only a single um, tuning parameter, but for the amplitude or energy detection, you can have many tuning parameters. And you can try different values for all those parameters and try every, every possible combination of all of the, the values of all the tuning parameters. And again, uh, look at those um, indices to pick up the combination that does the, uh, the best job at, at detecting your signals. Um, and so you can do this with the functions that come with this package. Again, I said, they're relatively simple to other things that are, are becoming available for detection um, of acoustic events. But um, you can still use the optimization, uh, well, diagnostic and optimization uh, functions for detections that you do with other software. So I think that's, that's also, that can be helpful uh, besides detecting things in there. Okay. Um, 
So once you did that, you just need to pick up the the best, uh, in this case, the threshold that does uh, the best job, or sometimes you have to, you know, like um, do some compromise between high sense, well, sensitivity and specificity if they are not perfect, but uh, you need to, to pick up the tuning parameters that do the best job, and then you can run the detection in those parameters. Uh, if you have a subsample of uh, training data, that will be the reference table and the some files that you annotated that is representative to the whole data set you want to annotate, um, it should be, um, the detection should be as good as the one that you are getting with that subsample of training data. And that's the idea, right? Once you do this, uh, figuring out which values work for my uh, detection task, you do it with a subset and once you feel fine, you, you can run it with the whole data set. And save time, you don't need to do it. Um, so this is what um, how well the two ways in which we will do or I will do these uh, annotations when things are relatively stereotyped or you have a good signal to narration signals I would do automatic detection otherwise I would do uh, manual detections but either way you will end up with some uh, selection or annotation table basically a uh, um, spreadsheet or a data frame that has um, the name of the sum files and the location in time, sometimes in frequency uh, of the signals that you want to uh, measure in our case, right? Like we want to uh, extract some features from. Um, so once you have that um, notation, um, the rest of the analysis should be more straightforward. And actually, I think we spend most of the time doing the annotations rather than doing the, the extraction of, of features, you know, like the quantification of the, the structure. Um, and that's why we have been pushing for ways to, to share the annotations, right? Like it doesn't make sense that uh, people is annotating the same, um, the same sum files over and over again. Um, and I still think we, we need to move in that direction. But anyway, so once you, you are able to get those uh, coordinates where the signals are in some files that you have, um, the next step is to extract some uh, numbers that represent the structure of the signals, right? And you can do that with Warble R, which is, I think that the main function, at least for, for me, is getting those numbers measuring the acoustic structure of signals. Um, but our features of the package involve like uh, doing these things in, in batch processing, you know, like you have a whole uh, uh, the uh, annotation table, so you can do the same measurements for all the signals that are referenced in those tables. And uh, it has a few, well, it have quite a bunch of function actually, functions to do other steps to make sure things are being measured in the right way and also for organizing the data um, that we won't have time to talk about those things. But um, those things are mostly done by creating spectrograms and overlaying the measurements of those spectrograms. Um, but it also can help for, well, have functions to do catalogs and explore, visually explore the variation in the signals and other things um, similar to that. But now I will be talking uh, only about the, well, mostly about how to, to get those measurements of acoustic structure. So with Warble uh, R, you can, once you have that uh, selection table or annotation table, the measurements, getting the measurements, in, I think is pretty straightforward. For instance, this function called spectral analysis, uh, use provide, this is the detection actually that we just run with the, the other package, uh -huh. um, and you can run this function, spectral analysis on, on anything that has the name of the sum files and the, the time coordinates, and if he has the frequency coordinates, that's even better. And if you do that, you get a bunch of measurements about the time um, and the distribution of, of energy in the frequency and the time domain. Uh, 
Um, I think that's a way to, to summarize those things. So those things are measured on the spectrogram, and, but also on the power spectrum and the weight envelope. And I think it's like 24 or 25 different measurements. Um, that is basically quantifying aspects of the structure of those signals. Um, and it does that for every signal that is referenced in your notation table. Uh, so this is uh, one example, just one uh, line of code and you can get those measurements. You can also measure other things like the male frequency capsule coefficients. Um, these are uh, some measures that are tuned to the psychoacoustics of, of human hearing, uh, but they turn out to be useful in some cases for also quantifying structures of uh, animal sounds. Um, and again, it's just like a line of code and you can get uh, those capsules coefficients for the same uh, signals that you have referenced in that detection uh, table or annotation table. Um, there are measurements that are pairwise similarity measurements. So it is not like an absolute value for each annotation, but it just tells you how similar um, each pair of um, sounds that are referenced in your uh, notation table are. Um, one of those measurements is the cross correlation. Um, you can use spectrographic or male frequency uh, cross correlation. Um, and it just gives you a number between zero and one in which uh, one is, you know, like they're this exactly the same and things closer to zero are, um, they don't have, um, they're not very similar, right? So this is a, um, this is a similarity matrix, not a distance matrix, but it's a triangular uh, similarity matrix, just to keep that in mind. Uh, and the diagonal in this case is one because it's representing the similarity to itself for each signal. So this is one of those measurements uh, that you can get a uh, pairwise similarity. And you can also use dynamic and warping distances. So this is a um, uh, method that is used for comparing time series. And it's a bit more flexible than just comparing, you know, like the values that, um, they're just running like a correlation for the, well, I should explain this better. So for this method, you first um, calculate the, con the frequency, dominant frequency contours. So across the signal in time, you get the um, points in the signal that have the maximum uh, amplitude or power spectral entropy because it's being measured on the spectrum, on the spectrogram. And once you have those time series, so it is gonna be just um, contours, right? How frequency changes through time. And you can compare those time series with this dynamic time warping. It's a bit flexible because it kind of accounts for, you know, changes in, in speed, like things that are similar, but in which the frequency changes just slightly later than other signals, that is, you still get some uh, similarity. Um, so it's a bit better than just running a correlation, and that's actually quite common in, in when you want to compare uh, time series. And you can do that with these uh, with acoustic signals, right? Like you track the dominant frequency contours, and then you compare those contours with dynamic time warping. Again, it's a single uh, line of code, and in this case, you actually get distances. Again, a pairwise distance matrix, a triangular matrix in which the di diagonal is zero. Um, but this is also ready to be used for uh, in further analysis. Um, and one thing that I wanted to stress about uh, Warbler or something that I, I use a lot and I think it can be helpful um, is the um, extended selection tables. Is, so you have these annotations that we were talking about in the form of data frames. You know, you have some song files in some directory and then you have this data in a text file or in, as an object in R when you have those uh, coordinates of time and frequency uh, for the signals in the song in those song files. Um, but with the extended selection tables, you can put all the data uh, together in a single uh, R object. So if this is the class so extended selection table. So you have the coordinates um, and also the acoustic data 
included in that object. Um, and I think, it, well, I've been using it a lot for uh, sharing the data, you know, like if you have, for instance, when people have found a bug or have a problem for the analysis, they can just send me that without having to send me a bunch of some files and sending the, the, the uh, annotations and also for improving uh, reproducibility of the analysis when I publish something and well, it's my own, uh, I'm using my own recordings. I create a selection table, uh, extended selection table, and I include that with supplementary materials and also the code that make use of that. So people can run, um, uh, replicate the, the exact same analysis that I did. Um, so in, in that sense, I found it pretty useful. And it also compresses in some way the data, right? Like most of the time we, at least for the things that we do in uh, behavior and um, evolution, we only care about the signals. We don't care that much about the background noise. So if we can just pick up those signals and isolate it um, from the rest of the data, then you're gonna end up with, with way smaller, um, like uh, object size than, than or um, I said file size than what you get if you have all the sound files, right? So it, in that sense also helps with um, sharing things and, and making it more reproducible. So you can create those uh, tables with this uh, function selection table. You just need to tell the function that you want to extend it one. Um, and once you do that, uh, it will, of course, it will look for the sound files. So they need to be in the path that you provided or the working directory. Um, and um, it has a specific printing method that you can use to double check everything is fine. Um, but the point here is that it includes all those wave objects. So you have the notations again and the acoustic data. And that's the, the, the main idea of this, um, that you have all the data. You can actually go and just extract those uh, wave objects that are included as attributes and you can do spectrograms or do anything you want with them. Um, but um, I found pretty health, um, I know, handy. Um, to to have all data together, and I think that's in many cases the the sources of you know like uh, problems when people are running analysis is the fact that you need to inform the uh, program in this case in this case R that you are working on these sum files that are located in this place. If you change something about the sum files, the names, the location, or you go back like five years later and you want to uh, rerun the analysis, it's unlikely that things are gonna be found in the same place or are gonna be found at all. So that also helps with these um, kind of issues. Okay, um, and once you, you have these measurements of acoustic um, structure, um, the idea is, well, you can run things on, on specific um, features like the duration, you can compare the duration, uh, there are hypotheses about how the duration changes, for instance, with size and things like that. But in many cases, we end up with, um, with some multidimensional uh, representation of the structure that it becomes sometimes hard to, um, to handle for doing the kind of statistical analysis that we tend to do. Um, and some hypotheses are framed in a way that they don't talk about specific uh, features of the signals, but more about the diversity of the sounds that are included or the sounds that are produced by species. Um, and in those cases, we can reframe those um, uh, hypotheses or predictions in terms of not specific features, but the spread of the signals of species in the acoustic space of the group or the individuals in the acoustic space of the species and so on. Um, so for to be able to do that, you need first to kind of summarize the variation in a few axes or dimensions that are uh, easy to, to handle. And then to be able to come up with those measurements of how uh, broad is the region that is occupied by 
individuals in the case of species or how similar those uh, regions are between individuals and so on. And so for doing that kind of um, measurements or quantifications of acoustic spaces, um, uh, we, well, this is a package that I developed with Karen Autumn. Um, we created this package called Phenotype Space. And we call it Phenotype and we were thinking about acoustic space, but it's actually just another example of a multidimensional phenotype. Uh, and people have been looking at uh, phenotype spaces for, for quite a while. So this, this can be applied to other phenotypes, of course, like, you know, like morphology or, um, but in this case, I'm just gonna show you some examples on how to do that with uh, acoustic spaces. Um, here I'm using this data set. This is an extended selection table that comes with, with uh, Warble R. I'm running some cross correlation. As I said, this um, creates um, this uh, similarity matrix. And with this package, you can uh, change the format of those matrices and um, reduce dimensionality uh, and then try to summarize the, the, the spaces for some groups of data that can be individual species and so on. Um, so that's what I'm doing here with converting this triangular matrix to a rectangular matrix. Uh, so reprojecting the data in a couple of dimensions, in, if you will. And then I'm adding some uh, labels to be able to tell the function that um, this uh, to which group each row uh, belongs to. So this is some data about um, recordings of sound types in Humber legs. So these are the labels that I added here. This is not that relevant, you know, to understand like the biology of this, but just I'm just showing you this so you understand the structure of the data that you need. Um, to be able to, to use these, um, the functions of this package. So here I have five examples of uh, 10 different sound types. This, each of these label is uh, uh, the label of one of the, of the sound types. So I have five samples for one of each. Um, and just to, to get a sense of, of this idea of acoustic spaces, this is how uh, this is reprojected acoustic space from cross correlation um, similarities looks like um, with the labels of the sound types. Um, and this is the kind of data that we tend to, to see and the distribution of, of groups that we tend to see with acoustic data. Um, so there are some groups that are, um, you know, like the, examples of the signals for that specific group, in this case, a sound type, are um, closer to each other than to uh, signals from other groups. But in some other cases, it's not that obvious, right? Um, these are more like um, clumped together. So you need some measurement that can tell you whether they are actually um, grouped by, um, in this case, by sound type, or there is no actual pattern uh, about the distribution of those um, of those signals in the acoustic space. And that's what we uh, aim to uh, quantify with the package, with this phenotype space. Um, well, there are several things that you can measure. Um, just gonna talk about a couple. Um, for instance, you can measure the, the size of the, in this case, the acoustic space. So for each group, you will get something, well, you need to tell what are the dimensions uh, that you're gonna use to calculate that and what is the, the grouping factor, right? So for each uh, of those levels in that grouping factor, you will get a measurement of the size. Um, you can also get some um, sense of how similar those spaces are, this function of space similarity um, gets, exactly, well, very similar data, but the output is um, a distance or similarity matrix. Um, that, uh, well, you need one more, you need this uh, other function from the same package to convert the output to that uh, triangular matrix. And it looks like this, it's similar to what I showed you about distances before. So basically how similar each uh, pair of those 
signals are. Um, and the diagonal is zero. So this is a bit um, abstract, um, but I'm gonna show you, well, explain um, an example, um, well, a study what we did in which we use these metrics and I guess it will help you to, to get a better sense of uh, how we can use this, uh, this package and these measurements to understand uh, patterns um, in animal vocalizations. So this is something uh, we published last year on um, the dimorphism in the songs of fairy wrens. So these are uh, birds are from Australia. Uh, and females, they have uh, songs that sometimes look as complex as the songs of the males. So we wanted, we wanted to understand uh, what factors, as I said, um, well, social or ecological factors were like favoring or um, promoting the evolution of those complex songs in males and females and why sometimes they are similar and once, why sometimes they are not that similar. And here I was, I'm just showing you the species that we included. And as you can see in the spectrograms, um, the songs can be quite uh, complex for both sexes. Uh, and Sorry, I can hear a noise here. All right. And this is, um, well, these are the figures that we include in this paper. I can share a paper with you guys if you want. But uh, um, basically, um, we projected, we took a bunch of measurements of the elements of the songs of those uh, um, species both, uh, for both males and females. We projected um, those measurements, well, reduced the dimensions and um, projected those um, songs in the acoustic space for each species, and then compare the um, well different features of the acoustic space for males and females to get a sense of how that dimorphism, uh, song dimorphism evolved. I won't talk too much about, uh, about the findings here, but that's basically uh, what you will do with this kind of package. So some things, some things what we found is a relationship between the acoustic uh, area overlap. So how similar the acoustic space of females, males and females, where um, seems to increase when you have uh, higher male survival. But we found the opposite, and I'm talking about these graphs over here, these scatter plots. The second one is the male survival in the x-axis. And I don't know if you can read that, but it says in the y-axis, acoustic area distance, um, and it decreases with male survival. And we found a similar pattern with latitude. Um, in which at higher latitudes, the, the size of the, of the acoustic space for males and females uh, became uh, more similar. Um, and basically the, the, well, just to get a, give you some um, idea of, of what it means is that the relationship, well, the roles of males and females, how similar they were, seem to be, uh, the ones that are affecting the structure of the, of the vocalizations for the sexes, how similar they are, how complex they can be. Um, and in the way that we did that is by quantifying those acoustic spaces and comparing those acoustic spaces um, with uh, the tools that I just talked about with this package, phenotype space. And I think I'm over, uh, time here. The last thing that I want to show you is this um, last package. It's called DynaSpec. Actually, it's with a lowercase d. <laughs> um, and we use it like the very last thing you're going to do when you do a study is to present that. Um, so we wanted to have some fancy uh, spectrograms that to show in presentations. So that's basically what this package does. Like you can use different color palettes. Um, and have these um, dynamic spectrograms. I don't know if you guys can hear that, but you can also play the sound and uh, show a different scales the variation in the structure of the signals. So um, the public can, have, can get a better sense of what signals are you you're talking about. And, and I think that's it. Yeah. So. Just to mention my collaborator, so I have been doing this with many people, um, specifically with 
Grace uh, Smith Vidare. She uh, is a co author or with the package Warbler. The, the package DinoSpec uh, I did it in collaboration with Matthew Wilkins. And many of the tools that I have been talking about, they have been developed by, um, you know, like um, brainstorming analysis of how can we do this better. And it hasn't been just me, it's this is interacting with many people, including my uh, PhD um, advisor team, right? And when I was doing a um, um, postdoc at the Lab of O, uh, it was an incredible time in which we have a lot of time to talk about those things. And many of these ideas actually uh, came to life during that time. Um, and that's it, that's all I have. Awesome, thank you, you so much, Marcelo. That's really cool to see. There's a, a lot of features in there. I didn't know that it had all that capability. Um, in the chat, Yen, Yen Yi Lu asks if it's possible to share the Odom 2021 paper. Um, oh, sure. Yeah, I'm going to put it there. If you're on the Conservation Bioacoustics Slack channel, that could be a, a venue for doing that, or just the link here. Okay. Sure, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna share. I realize that we're about time, and if anybody needs to go, please feel free. Um, if anyone has questions and wants to stay on for a few minutes, Marcelo, do you have a few minutes to stay on for questions? Yeah, yeah. Hi, Marcelo. I had a question. Uh, firstly, I'm a big fan of your Wobbler package. I've really enjoyed using it throughout my PhD. Uh, oh, thank you. I uh, had a question about the selection table feature that seems to be consistent across a lot of the packages you've written, including R Raven and uh, Wobbler, and then you know, you're know you using it in the other packages that you described. Uh, so the question I had was uh, for some of the annotations that were previously made on Raven, which don't necessarily follow the format of the selection table that you require for the wobbler packages. Are you thinking of adding any functionality so that you know I can use some of the annotations that were previously made, uh, essentially to run other uh, functions that you've created, like the DFTs and you know other analysis that's there in wobbler. So I feel like I run into this error where it needs to be this particular format. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering if that's something that can be accommodated. Okay. Sorry, I missed the part of, of where those selections came from or why they have a different format. So they were made from Raven, but they weren't exported in the format. Like, you know, like it wasn't like exporting a text file or the exact format that you require for Wobbler. So I'm just curious if it can still be uh, included uh, to run other downstream analyses in Wobbler if the format okay. is not, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, I, they could. Um, so the issue, I mean, if you already have that data in R um, and the data comes from multiple sound selection tables, you know, like you have annotations for more than one sound file and they were made uh, in, um, you know, like in this view that you can concatenate several sound files in Raven, then it gets a bit tricky to, um, to get the actual time positions of the signals in the original recordings. Um, that's the only problem that I, I can see. I mean, if you have annotations in which you have a single uh, annotation per sound file, then it should be a straightforward to um, you know, format the data and get it in the right format for Warbler. But uh, in those cases in which you have more than one sound file annotations, then the Raven does some modifications of the, well, not the modification, but the time that is being included represents the, the time in the whole, um, you know, like the line of sound files, concatenated sound files. So the times in the second sound file um, you know, like the start on no begin and end. I don't remember the names in Raven. Yeah, begin time and end time. They will be the time in the second um, sound file plus the duration of the first sound file in that uh, 
uh, sequence of sound files and so on, right? So if you don't do it, uh, if you don't convert that with R Raven right away and you import that into R, uh, then it's gonna be hard to, to do that um, adjusting of those of those parameters. Oh, well, mostly the, the timestamps. That's the only issue that I can see. But for the rest, I, I think it should be the straightforward. Um, I don't know if you're thinking about an R, R Raven function uh, that can, you know, not only importing things that come from a text file, but also reformatting objects that you already have in, uh, in R. If that's the case, I, I will ask you to, to add an issue um, in the in GitHub, um, I mean, if you feel comfortable with that, if not, just send me an email. Uh, issues make more pressure to <laughs> developers because you need to to deal with it. Uh, and ex just explain what you just did, or I mean, it doesn't have to be like very thorough. And I will keep that in mind and uh, try to add something for that in the next version. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Um, I see a question here in the chat. Um, so let me see. For the phenotype space part of the talk, what does the numbers in the metric tell us? Yeah, thanks for the question. I'm sorry about, I think I included too much stuff and then <laughs> it gets a, a bit, it got a bit um, saturated. Um, so this is, for the matrix. Well, I guess you're talking, yeah, the slide 39. So Genji is asking, what does the number of the in the matrix tell us? Um, in this case, uh, are we using this function of space similarity? And, you know, like the um, overall point for this is to get a sense of how similar the acoustic uh, regions of different, uh, you know, subgroups in the data could be like species uh, or individuals in the species acoustic space, uh, how similar those regions are. Um, and there are different methods. So one of the methods is that, well, the one that I'm using here is centroid distance. So basically you calculate the, the median centroid of, of the cloud of points for each group. And then you measure the distance between all pairwise distances between those centroids. And the, the idea here is that things that, um, well, subspaces for which the centroids are closer, they should be more similar, or they should be found in a more similar region of the acoustic space. Um, so if you look at this, uh, this is, well, one way to read this is this sun type, um, which could be a species, right? Or it could be a population. This, yeah, I think this makes things a bit harder to understand, but this is just one label for the groups that you are comparing. Um, this one is more, has an acoustic space, uh, occupies an area of the acoustic space that is more similar to this one, to sat F1, than to log D1, for instance, right? This is number is, um, no, sorry, sorry, the other way around. This number is lower, the distance is shorter, they're more similar. So it bear, BR2A1 is more similar to log D1 to, than to sat F1, for instance. And that's the way that, that you will read that. But the point here is that it gets, you know, like when you have all, in this case, we have just 10 um, levels in this, for these groups, it can get very um, dense, the, the output of the quantification of this. Uh, and that's why we need ways in, to do that systematically um, um, and to get data formats that can be easily input into, uh, well, the, the thing, the tools we use for statistical analysis, for instance. Does, does it make sense? 
Yep, thank you. <laughs> I think I understand better now. Okay, cool. Um, so, thank you. Yeah. There is another question. I don't know if you want me to. Uh, about filtering sound clips. Oh, yeah. Is, pos is it possible to filter sound clips above and below to find frequency bound useful for? Yeah. Um, the, the way that I see these um, applying like uh, filters is by using, uh, well, band passes, right? That's the, the way that we call them. Uh, but the functions, many functions will do this automatically if they find a columns referring to the frequency range of the signals. So if you have something, if you have low, what's called bottom frequency and top frequency, then the function will focus on the pairwise range. I mean, for instance, for cross correlation, uh, the, the pairwise range of the two things that are being compared um, and we'll exclude anything else. So it will run actually a band pass uh, within that range. Uh, so it's actually filtering out sounds that are um, out of the range. Um, I think the argument, well, the, the, argu the functions, most functions have an argument called BP for band pass. So you can modify that. You can say, or oh, I want all comparisons to be within the same range, or you can do it in the pairwise manner. And if it's not like a pairwise metric, you know, like a spectral analysis, where you have like a spectrographic features, um, you can use the same argument to do this uh, kind of uh, filtering. Um, yeah, I think that's it for the chat. I don't know if you guys have any other questions. All right. Thank you so much, Marcelo, for taking the time to join us and for the really interesting presentation. That's been a lot of fun. No problem. Thank you, Laura, for, for inviting me. Yeah. Are you on the, if you wish to be on the Slack channel, sometimes you'll get some follow-up questions and things like that there, but we can coordinate on that offline. Oh, cool. Yeah, I will, I will try to, to join. I think you, you shared that link with me. Okay. I can resend also. Cool. Thanks again. It's great to have you. Yeah, no problem. Have a great week, everybody. Um, two weeks from now, we will have Dina talking about another more specific R package. Um, I believe it's Gibbon R. It's specifically um, focused on the analysis of Gibbon calls and some of the work that she's been doing. So hope to see you there and we will talk to you all soon. Take care. <laughs>